Okay, welcome to David Koresh's new hangout. Come on in and drink some Kool-Aid, courtesy of Jim Jones, and welcome glad all y'all are here. I like <laughs> all the motherfuckers talking about me starting a new cult. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I can't pay for that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some things tonight that people are not going to like. I might do a little ball breaking, but I'm going to discuss those. I had some ideas of masculinity with regards to... Um, with regards to cultivating uh, certain healthy aspects towards life. And uh, I'm going to take it all from the lore. Obviously, I'm going to have kind of my spin on it, but uh, take it for what it's worth. If you've got the courage and you can make it work, it'll probably work real good in your life. There's a lot of people in the world that are doing, uh, in the masculinity industry, a couple of them are, are my friends, and they have, uh, they have exceptional outlines with regards to how to, how to build things. And operates successfully in this world, how to plan, how to prepare, logical order thinking, all of these things. And all of them are exceptional resources to bring to bear against the problems in life. I think the one thing that happens though is they take for granted the idea that the people they're dealing with might really be men to begin with. Because I see some failings. I see some glaring faults in some of the things that are happening now. I'm gonna start with the Groa Galder. It's a real interesting tale. We're gonna do the Groa Galder, we're gonna talk about Frey, and we're gonna talk about Sigurd. All of them have a journey with regards to masculinity that we have to pay attention to. And the fact is, is um, since that was written in the last 2,000 or 10,000 years, and none of us created any new emotions. We all feel the same way. We all have the same feelings. We all have the same hurts, same pain, same hope, same desires. Everybody wants to do good. Everybody wants to see their kids do good. Everybody wants somebody to stand beside them in the toughest of times. For generations, for thousands of years, that was arranged. And you fucking figured it out. Or with the peoples of Northern Europe, you had the right to separate or seek a divorce or however the women had the rights to say, whoa, this guy ain't cutting a mustard, two quivers and a shiver, get him out of here. You know, and that was a legitimate recourse. I can't believe I just said that. Fuck. At any rate, there's still a pattern there of a responsibility of expected results, of, expecti of expectations for men to grow up and become part of something in a tribe. <clears throat> and it's outlined in the lore in a couple of different places, and we're going to talk about all three tonight. I'll try to make it uh, succinct and clear and um, hopefully offer some kind of the sound guidance that we need to, um, to be able to grasp hold of some of these quality teachings that my friends offer to men in this world. Um, you start with the grow galder, you start with his vip dag, and grow a spell. He says, wake, grow, awake, mother good, at the doors of the dead I call thee, thy son bethink thee, thou baits to seek thy help at the hill of death. So that's, that's really an important thing. You have to realize when this was written, the Grogalder, the Svipdag's Mall, is a 17th century poem. It's, it's, it's only found in the paper copies of the, of the lore. It's not found much further back. So even if it is 17th century, what we have here is a real interesting distillation in the fact that people are still thinking about this. People are still have an understanding in the 17th century. Now, to have that understanding in the 17th century, you have to realize one thing. They were burning people at the stake for this knowledge. And here we, here we have this real fine distillation. The problems amongst young men are the same then as they are now, and much further back. But it's a real interesting scene here. Even a cursory examination of the great literature over the ages has wise men, kings, peasants alike, discussing the affairs of life with the dead. Now, that's really interesting. That all we seek is some spirit to provide instruction for a path which is unseen. I think a lot of the times we call that faith. And there's always a knee-jerk reaction against that word. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. That's, that's too much. That's like where I came from. Well, listen here. For uh, thousands of years, there were priests in every little village who represented some kind of deal and offered you some kind of guidance, and you had to trust in the gods for something along the lines of luck in battle skill, happiness in a marriage, fertility. Those things required faith because people didn't always know that when a man and a woman got together, there was going to be a baby. Sometimes it didn't always happen that way. 
there's a great deal of faith placed on these gods that fertility and abundance will be a part of your home. We've kind of lost some of that. But we seek some kind of reassurance to bolster the confidence of men and women alike. Why are we having such a hard time looking through this lore and understanding what it takes to grow up? Because that's kind of at the root of some of the things I see today. See, Svipdag approaches the grave mound of his mother, Groa. Now, Groa is mentioned in the Eddas elsewhere. If you remember, Groa is the woman who tried to charm that piece of flint out of Thor's head after he defeated the stone giant. Then he got to run in his mouth and got to talk, and it's still stuck there. But it's an example that amongst the Deesir, there are very powerful members of female members of our family that provide guidance and support and, and instruction. And if you look at it and think about it, from the time you're born, there's probably a midwife pulling you out. Your mother's burying you. A midwife is pulling you out. Your sisters and your mother, you grow up with them till about seven, and then the men take you and you become something different. Hopefully that process results in the kind of quality man in the tribe that has what it takes to secure a good, strong, faithful, loyal wife, partner in life. And then they have more kids. And then when you die, your mother and your, or your wife or your daughter, they prepare you for death. Then you're escorted to the burial mound. And then the sun facing goddess hell who rules over Helheim and the house, all the halls of our ancestors but see, there's a woman involved all along this process of being a man. And we get confused in that sometimes. Spitbag is a problem because he tries to sidestep some of the ideas of becoming a man, asking his mother for a blessing. Okay? <laughs> she's, so we have a pretty good idea. She's pretty familiar with the workings of the divine. If she's charming a piece of fin out of Thor's head, well, that, that's a real powerful indication of something. Okay, it's a conclusion we might safely draw. She has an understanding of these divine natures. We might also conclude that the DC are quite powerful. Now, we've mentioned them amongst ourselves on a routine basis today. Everybody mentions it and talks about it. We don't really quite grasp what it means. See, there's a... Uh, Ancestor reverence is a real important part of what we do. But sometimes we kind of get it twisted up. The description of what ancestor reverence looked like in the 17th century, in, as written in this tale, is a real important bridge between where we are today and where we came from with regards to our faith and the, and the reverence we held for our ancestors. See, we don't have a Mexican Day of the Dead. We don't have some of these celebrations for the Day of the Dead that they have in Southeast Asia. We have Memorial Day, for all the fat of a good that does us, but it's, it's a toehold. It's something we can work with. It's something we can go for. Now, I may be drifting off the subject, but I'll get back to it in just a second. <laughs> See, throughout history, the people of Northern Europe and around the world, and still do, it is our ancestors, our parents who have passed on who might plead our cases before the divine with the most passion. That's how it's typically thought of. Who might lend their strength and understanding from beyond the grave to support us in the trials of life. That's what we want to believe, right? Well, perhaps this is not the most accurate way to describe it either. It still has the overtones of a pope or a priest asking for the concessions because, well, we aren't worthy of it. As if we might be at the mercy of the gods living under a probationary status, a status which can only be rescinded if only we lived up to some standard that we really don't know what it is. And that's tough. That's hard to do. But let us consider for, an, for another moment where a being seeks the aid of his ancestors. Consider Odin hanging on the tree. Let me blow your lips off here for a second sacrificing himself to himself. And I've often said he's killing his ego, so to speak. A lot of people hate that. Well, you're going to get over it one way or another. That ruinous idea which tells us we are better than someone based upon an arbitrary set of conditions we ourselves have provided. See, Nietzsche said when God is dead, we can invent our own set of morals. Well, let's look at the situation we're in today. For many of us, that is the situation, and we seek to create for ourselves our own set of morals. What happens if we break those morals? 
Is it just going to be a sleepless night? Or is it going to shatter our psyche so that we have permanent psychological damage because of the damage we've done to the people around us? So we look to this Lord to find these kind of, this guidance and these answers. And we are coming up against a problem where we, the longer we deal with it, the more we begin to understand this is not a justification to keep acting an ass in society. Now all of a sudden we've got something we need to live up to. But, I, but back to Odin. In that moment when Odin is right at the doors of death, he's hung there for nine days and nights. He's at the moment fixing to literally give up the ghost himself. <laughs> that moment when he is so close that he can hear the songs of his ancestors, an unseen hand cuts him down. And he gathers up in pain and agony the cumulative knowledge of the ancestors in the jeweled form of the runes. An outline for the path of every person's life, as well as so much more. He has literally taken the wisdom of Helheim for himself. As above, so below. As we approach, as Vipdag approaches the grave mount, he's hoping for that same kind of understanding and collection of knowledge. And this is a powerful scene to be sure, yet we have watched countless cultures reenact it on a personal, tribal, and indeed even a national level to try and claim a heritage with all the inherent knowledge and culture and understanding, which has typically been signified by its accomplishments. It is an integral part of much of what we're doing. Whether we like it or not, the conduit for the transfer of such energy is love. Now, Groa is a wise woman. She says, what evil vexes mine only son? She already knows what's going on. What baleful fate hast thou found? She knows something's, he's facing something he can't deal with. That thou callest thy mother who lies in the mold and the world of the living has left. First and foremost, it's an observation of concern, a mother for her son. Now, we see a similar aspect of this between Thor and Thrud. Concern for a father, concern of a father, for a daughter when Alvis comes calling. For the masculine, protection of the feminine is sometimes simply to stand in the door, as Thor does with Alvis. Oh, you ain't coming in here. You ain't worthy. He doesn't beat him up. He doesn't demonstrate um, a belligerent attitude. He simply uses a contest of wits, delays the inevitable, and suckers the guy into stripping over his own feet. <laughs> for the feminine to impart some of what the masculine or soon to be masculine son needs, it requires more than just smarts. It requires wisdom and love. You see, there are a few literary devices which so illustrate that in the reader's mind as the appearance of a deceased loved one to offer support and guidance. It touches our heart. It is one of those ideas which is, it resonates throughout every great body of literature. Indeed, it's so powerful, the idea of the departed coming back to offer support, guidance, love, and wisdom is so powerful, it is the cornerstone of much of the Abrahamic faiths, particularly Christianity. Think about that. And for us and our ancestors, it was a common everyday occurrence. Well, how did we get suckered into believing it was just one place when for all of us had access to the divine through our ancestors in the past, including instruction on how to be good men? See, Groa reminds us all that the love of this mother extends beyond the grave. Ain't that something? The thought that my grandmas still think about and love me. Wow, that touches me, even today. It also removes the fear of death, for they are always with us. Such was a part of the way of life of our ancestors. What appears to be miraculous to us today was an everyday occurrence in the minds of these ancient societies. As such, the ancestor knows that she's been called in a moment of perceived need. And I say perceived need because that's exactly what it is. Zvitbeck spake, the woman false whom my father embraced, so he's already pissed off his dad's got him a stepmom, has brought me a baleful game. She's challenged him, for she bade me go forth where none may fare, and Mingloth the maid to seek. And sometimes we might think ourselves a little bit lost in the world. Zvitbeck, whose name means swift day, is very much confused. His name offers us some insight into the situation. 
see the impetuous, impetuousness of youth, always afraid they're going to miss something. I remember that feeling very well. Oh my gosh, they're going to have a party and I'm going to miss it. Oh my gosh, they're going to do something and I'm going to miss it. Oh, I got to rush over here. I'm going to miss it. And sometimes that sticks with us today. Oh my, I missed something. It's a real difficult deal to calm down and realize everything's going to work in my favor. That's a real important aspects to get, especially as I approach 50. I'm not in such a rush to go run around and make a fool of myself, though I do this every week. I mean, it's kind of a dichotomy, maybe a false dichotomy, but it's funny as shit, so we're going to keep doing it. <laughs> Most young men have no problem with a contest of physical strength or endurance. It's what we're built for. We're literally built for the fight. But what happens, though, when one is challenged in an arena that they are unfamiliar with? Are the unproven, untested ones, they're going to ask their mama. In this case, Svipdag's father, see, he doesn't go to his dad and say, hey, dad, how do I do this? He goes to mama. Svipdag's father has a new bride. And I really think, I really think if you look at it, she sees that this young man just needs to quit laying around on his ass playing video games. And I'd lay dollars to donuts. She challenged him to find a woman to love. And he piped up like John Wayne saying, oh, yeah, I can do that. Hold my beer. <laughs> In short, I have a suspicion that he let his alligator mouth overload his Tweety Bird ass. And Groa knows this, too. Because <laughs> that's his mama. She proceeds to handle it with grace, dignity, and charm. <coughs> Excuse me of the most refined of noble women. See, that is a good mom. That's good stuff. He didn't go wrong there, did he? Grow a spake, long is the way and long must thou wander, but long is love as well. Thou mayest find perchance what thou fain wouldst have, if the fates their favor will give. It ain't gonna be handed to you. It ain't just gonna be handed to you. Like any good sage, Groa already perceives what the matter may be. She offers him that opiate of the masses, hope. But the encouragement to love is more than just blind hope. It is given with the understanding that there is work to do. In that work, the actual effort to be better, to become worthy of such attention, the insinuation that such a display of personal industriousness will draw the favor of the fates. I like that. If you look at our ancient cultures, if you look at how they cast lots, if you look at how they gambled so much that they would find themselves in indentured servitude, they believed that if they were living right, their luck would hold true. Their skill would hold them in battle. They're doing the right thing. They're living upright, honorable lives. Not because they said they were, but because the people in their community said, that's an honorable man, that's an honorable woman. They're doing the right thing even when no one's looking. They believed in their luck. Same thing. They're drawing the positive attention of the fates. How much effort would you put into traveling the long road for the one you love? What about just the chance to love someone very special? Well, that's not such a certain thing, is it? Svitbag requires more than just the encouragement of his buddies. Because this truly is a journey which will kill off some parts of him. And he's going to have to grow up and leave some of his childish ways behind. That's tough, even at 50, to figure some of that out for myself. It is a failing which is common among men and women. And the thought always occurs to us, because we live in such a comfortable world, well, how can I continue on to this relationship without changing too much? Every person deals with it to some degree. Every person deals, what will my buddies think, or what will my girlfriends think? Mostly, though, there is a chance of rejection at some point, and no one's ego wants to deal with that. So we approach it all from the guarded and protected point of view about how we're going to protect our image when this is all over. I mean, no one wants to look like a fool. I mean, in my first two divorces, and I did say two, I felt like I had fool written in big words right across my damn forehead. I did the best I could. I thought I was doing right. Hey, I was firing on all cylinders. No, you were not had fool written on my forehead. And I walked around, felt shame, remorse, sadness, guilt, all of that nasty stuff you're supposed to feel when you get split up. <laughs> oh, 
all we are doing is creating an awful lot of painful work for ourselves in the future, which is, it takes a lot of work to wipe that off your forehead. In this situation is facing Vitbag, his challenges are of a nature that there are no shortcuts. There ain't no shortcut to be had in this. He must grow up to seize his destiny. That's a real challenge. Svitbag spake, charms full good, the enchants me, mother, and seek thy son to guard. For death do I fear on the way I shall I fare, and in years I am young, methinks. Hmm. Such is the trouble with the young mind. It cannot grasp the idea that only part of us must be left behind. It is something which everyone who is successful at suicide or those contemplating it cannot seem to comprehend. Whenever we come to a crossroads where some part of ourselves needs to be left behind to continue on our journey, we, well, we all too often internalize it as if it is the entirety of who we are, which is being rejected and it hurts and we enjoy it and we relish in it and we sit there and we get drunk and it's poor me, poor me, poor me another drink. Honestly, it can be a terrifying thing to make this realization. Because with that realization, there's the understanding, I can do something about this. Hey, it's just that part of me. How can I work on that and make myself better? The absence of any kind of legitimate masculine or feminine guidance in today's world only magnifies this issue. Where are the men telling other men, look, buddy, it's just, let's work on this part. Let's do this. How about this? Where are the girls telling the other girls, hey, maybe not so much, huh? It's what them sewing circles were all about. It's what these men training for combat was all about. See, Spit Dog is not at the point, this point, ready to make the sacrifices necessary to claim his rightful place at the side of someone destined for him. He literally says he is afraid for his life. She's not going to love the boy. She's going to cherish the man. And in that pairing, that man can become a king and that woman a queen. There's an interesting dynamic there. If you look at uh, Kali and uh, I can't remember his name. At any rate, I guess I'm not supposed to talk about it. So he's asking his deceased mother for a little bit, a little boost. He wants to cheat, so to speak. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. He believes he might, you know, he neatly sidestep the requirements to grow into a real man by asking for blessings from the beyond. And we have seen the overpowering influences of a mother in many other tales. The most obvious, of course, is Achilles. But we've all had friends that had to sit in the house while we were all outside beating each other up. Those little boys that look out the window and watch us playing football and hurting each other, and crying and fighting and running away, dirty. Oh no, you can't go out there, you might get hurt. Watch Pink Floyd The Wall and you'll get a pretty good example when he sings that song, Mother, it's the same thing. The attempt to cultivate overpowering masculinity by appealing to the divine feminine always leaves a chink in the armor. Now think about how many men you know who have in the past or are right now waiting on their wives or girlfriend to tell them that they are man enough. See the problem? Well, grow is a wise woman, and indeed, it might be counted as a tale above reproach from our culture. What a magnificent understanding of the dynamics of what it means to make that separation. This tale truly is. And grow begins to work her magic. I felt like Dr. Evil saying that. But is it really magic? All she teaches him are the simple steps of what it takes to be a man as Odin relays with the use of the rooms. She just kind of goes over it. The very first one's the simplest one. Then first I will chant thee the charm often tried that Randy taught to rind from the shoulder, whatever mislikes thee shake for help or thyself shalt thou have. You can only rely on yourself. So we get into this cultivation of becoming a man. What else does it look like when men begin to seek a partner in masculinity? What else does it look like? So we've kind of identified that maybe mom's, mom's got some wisdom. Mom's going to help you out with some things. The desir are going to be there for you. 
but it's other men that confer masculinity upon other men, not women. She tells him the simple rules for living a good, solid life. She doesn't work any charms on him. These are all wonderful tales, but when you read the fine print, it's simply do what you're supposed to be doing. Stand up, tell the truth, be honest, work hard, take care of yourself, be a good man. That gives him an, there was no magic worked in that. And it's a beautiful tale as you continue to read through it. If we look at, um, if we look at uh, from a different angle of it, if we look at Frey and Gerder, Frey and Gerder seeking partner. Now Frey is, Frey is that gentle rain in the spring, but he's also an accomplished warrior. His sword is so, you can't, if his sword is so skillful, it, it fights of his own accord. Maybe you can call that a shortcut too, if you want. But he is prosperity and abundance and, for, and fertility from the masculine side. He is the son of Njord and, and, and maybe Yord, and we can't ever really tell, but the earth and the sea providing that masculinity of prosperity and abundance in a masculine and feminine form. What a true blessing upon all of us. If we, ask, if we look at the tale, so Skirner, you know, you have uh, Njord, he asks Skirner, he says, go now Skirner and seek to gain speech from my son and answer to win from the wise one is easily moved. His own father calls him a wise one. And in other tales, it is Njord and Skadi who ask about their son. So that if you look at that carefully, there is a father and a stepmother asking about their son. So the scenario is repeated here. There's a pattern beginning to emerge. But Frey takes a different approach. He's already proven himself a warrior. He's already proven himself a king, the Lord of Alfheim. But now he's found something that's a different arena he doesn't know how to compete in, just like Svidbag, except at a different stage in life. How do we contend with that later in life? Well, Svidbag has to figure out which of his boyish ways he has to leave behind to become the man worthy of taking the hand of the woman he loves, is destined for. Frey has to understand at his stage of life, being the great warrior, the wise one, the Lord of Alfheim, what does he sacrifice to take the hand of one who so charms him? <laughs> Skirner asked him, he's worried about it. He said, Frey said, how shall I tell thee, thou young hero? Of all my grief so great, he got it bad. <laughs> Though every day the elf beam dawns, it lights my longing never. He can't stop thinking about her. She's on his mind. Thy longing, methinks, are not so large that thou mayest not tell them to me. Here's another man talking to another man. Talk at me, buddy. See what's going on. Masculinity working with masculinity. Since in the days of yore we were young together, we too might each other trust. That's very important. Men can't work together and figure something out and boost each other up and step forward to do something together. I mean, we might as well be playing the penis showing game on waiting. Frey spoke, from Gimir's house I beheld go forth a maiden dear to me. Her arms glittered and from their gleam shone all the sea and sky. Imagine being so struck by the beauty of someone. Their eyes are so magnificent. You feel like you could swim in them. Imagine being so charmed by the character of their laugh that, they, that it illustrates your dreams. And this is where Frey is at. He's seen something more than some woman that's way out of his league. What do I have to do to get next to her? And so he's talking to another man about it which is as it should be. He's not asking mama. He's asking a buddy. They have fought together. They have cried together. They have tussled with each other and they have tussled against others together. A man. He lays it on him. Dude, I don't know what to do. How do I fix this situation? What do I got to do? To me more dear than in the days of old was ever a maiden to man. But no one of gods or elves will grant that we both be together. 
He feels there's no recourse. It's hopeless. What shall I do? In his current state of mind, it is. In his current state of mind, that's as far as he'll ever go. But he's not willing to risk what he needs to risk to stand beside this woman who is Frey is the summer, the, is the spring sunshine and the gentle rain. Gerder is the northern lights. It's going to be real hard for them two to get together, isn't it? So he's got to give something up. Skirner spake, he said, then give me the horse that goes through the dark and magic flickering flames and the sword as well that fights of itself against the giant grim. Frey spake, the horse will I give thee that goes through the dark and magic flickering flames and the sword as well that will fight of itself if a worthy hero wields it. So he lays a challenge at his feet. You're right. I'm going to set aside the ideas of the soldier. I'm going to set aside the ideas of the warrior mentality so I might step into the role of the lover and the husband and be what I'm supposed to be. And he hands off that very powerful masculine phallic symbol of the sword. <laughs> now, I had an interview with Jack Donovan, and he put another spin on it that I had never thought of before. He's just getting rid of part of himself. But all too often, men will sacrifice the entirety of their being to satisfy a woman they think that they are in love with. They will bend over backwards. They will become boot-licking guys that walk behind the wife as she controls the pocketbook and the money and all of that nonsense that goes with it because they, well, they don't want to get rid of what they need to get rid of and become a man to stand up confident. No, that's not how it's going to be. We're going to work together through all this. Well, what if she don't love me if I do all that? Oh. Well, how about be a man about it? So that's man to man. Building each other up, helping each other recognize what to sacrifice, what to set aside to be that person worthy of loving. Because I got to tell you, I see people make lists of the kind of woman that they're going to have in their life. And the only thing I see them doing is trying to negotiate what, is, what parts of themselves they're going to have to set to the side or set aside or how they're going to grow into so they don't have to really face up to the fact that they create these impossible lists of traditional women and, and all of the things they say and can't say, even though they might be sporting a set of tits themselves, they got all these things to say about, this is the kind of woman I'm going to have in my life. Listen, there's a couple of things you're going to have to deal with. Number one, do some sit-ups. But, but number two, maybe you might look at what you need to sacrifice to become more than just a soldier. And if you've never been a soldier, you might start taking a good, long, hard look at how much of your boyhood and young adventurer teenager you've set aside. Because there's a real crucible of fire that comes when you men find them, when boys find themselves in those toughest of situations where you've got to knuckle it up or go under. Not every man gets to go through that. And some men face it much later in life than others, but we will always have to face it. If we are ever to become that quality partner worthy of drawing the attention of those kind of women that we respect and admire and secretly want to love. It's a terrifying thing, and it involves a huge amount of risk. You might, work, you might end up with the word fool on your forehead. Try again. But see, I don't ever want to see men in this faith, men in this way of life, stop trying. Well, I've had enough. I'm not going to try anymore. Don't. Always have that courage to try and love. What more brave thing can you do in a world where violence is against the law? What's the bravest thing you can think of than to step up and become something more and try to love someone standing at your side? Now, it's not always reciprocated. Sometimes the other party, they're not willing to give up what they need to give up to become something more either, to justify the presence of a good man in their life. I understand that. It doesn't mean we stop trying. Because I promise you, there's a woman out there telling these girls, 
listen here, you are gonna cut that nonsense out. If you wanna ever have somebody decent in your world, I promise you it's happening. Those conversations are going on. Now there's another example in the lore of what it means to secure the hand of someone you love. And it is by far the most beautiful and romantic of the tales as far as I'm concerned. We have to understand where it comes from too and what he has to go through because here's the, here's the transition from young man adventurer to warrior. So for every stage of life in, in, a man's, in, in, in the stages of masculinity in a man's life, there's a tale that examines what it takes to do this. And every one of them is this romantic notion of the best thing you can do is secure that hand and have that next generation so they might know how to do it as well. And we lost it, gave it up for convenience and the justice of the peace. And we got bamboozled with ideas of the love we see on television. And now we're stuck. There's a whole generation of us that seems like we're existing in a void of emotional cold and darkness. And these tales, once again, I firmly believe, are God's through us a little bit of a lifeline. Pull yourself out, guys. Come on. Pull yourself out. Let's try it again. And this is Sigurd's tale. Now, Sigurd rode up on Hyunderfall and turned southward toward the land of the Franks, my peoples. On the mountain, he saw a great light as if a fire were burning and the glow reached up to heaven. And when he came thither, there stood a tower of shields and above it was a banner. Svipdag comes into the same thing. He comes into, but this time there's a giant guarding the ring of fire. He also has to negotiate this path. And as the tale progresses in the, in the Svipdag small, you see all three of these stages occur in one man's life as he finds Mingloff the necklace clad. The necklace clad. That's like finding the goddess of fertility and abundance, Freya herself. There is some idea that it might be owed. But I digress. <laughs> Sigurd went into the shield tower and saw that a man lay there sleeping with all his war weapons. That's important to remember. Because he's still wearing the helm of all. That great helm that we all wear to let other people around us know, messing with me or you, it might not be a good idea. We wear that helm of all to keep others at bay, to keep them at an emotionally safe distance. We wear that, we stick our chests out. It's like those guys about midnight in the bar, the ones that realize they're not going home with anybody, they'll start walking around, their chest stuck out like a bunch of turkeys. Did you look at me? Did you look at me? And here we go. If you, you know, those guys that aren't going home with anybody at midnight in the bar, they're the ones that are gonna get in a fight. Sigurd is wearing the helm of all, that same mentality. And what he sees with Sigurd laying there is a man dressed in the weapons of war. It befuddles his vision. It confuses him as to what's really in front of him. Sometimes we get a little confused too as to what's really in front of us. <laughs> he took the helm off and then he saw that it was a woman. The male coat was fast as if it had grown to the flesh. And then he cut the male coat from the head opening downward and out to both armholes. Then he took the male coat from her and she awoke and sat up and saw Sigurd and said, what bit through the burning? How was broke? How was my broken my sleep? Who made me free of the fetters pale? Now there's a real interesting idea that, and I have been a long and loud proponent of the idea that one of the responsibilities we have as men is to create an environment where the women or the partners that we have uh, have an environment where they're free to express the beauty of the, who they are, and that's it right there. That's where I get it. One of the most powerful responsibilities we have is to create that environment where they might express the beauty of you. Now, it's a wild thing. It's a wild, it's primal nature, reproduction, savagery, tigers killing antelopes, all that nonsense. And we don't control that. We don't have any control over that nonsense. That's a real intimidating thing. It threatens to overwhelm us with their, their sexual appetites. It's a scary thing. Nobody wants to admit that. Well, I'm a manly man doing manly things. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> You're going to find out, ain't we, buddy? 
So <laughs> there's a, it's a real intimidating thing for a man to, to try to step up to the plate and say, and create like a safe room for a lunatic. <laughs> because it's going to be crazy. But it's also going to be so beautiful, your heart can't stand it. It's going to be children and happy laughter. And it's going to be a smile when you wake up. And it's going to be beauty when you get home. And it's going to be that touch, that reassurance. It's going to be all of those things. And that's as alien a language to the masculine mind as it can be. A woman might as well be speaking an alien dialect if he were to ever try to understand that. Hence the idea that masculinity comes from other men, not from the woman. No woman will ever tell you you're man enough and it mean anything. She will show you. She will show you in a thousand different ways if you let her. And there's nothing we have any control over. For a bunch of dudes, that can fix anything in front of them, that are not afraid of physically engaging another man in a fisticuff, that are willing to run towards the gunfire, that are willing to run towards the fight, that are willing to stand up and be counted. To realize that that is kind of scary, I won't talk about that. We're not going there. But at some point in our life, we have to take off the helm of all and recognize the woman in front of us. And that ain't the easiest thing to do because that represents a huge exposure to pain. Because, yep, they damn sure might stab you right in the heart because they ain't all right. Some of those women will do it simply because they enjoy doing it because their daddies didn't treat them right, their first husband wasn't right to them, whatever, they've been beaten, abused, and kicked around all their life by lesser men. And here we jump up here like John Wayne talking about how we're going to do it right. They may not know how to react to it either. They may not understand what's going on as well. It takes a lot of courage for a man to stand up there and say, here it is. If you rip it out, chew on it, spit it, and stomp it on the ground, I'll try again somewhere else. That takes a lot of damn courage, and other men encourage other men. Now, when you find yourself surrounded by a bunch of ego-driven men that say, I told you so, I could have told you, well, blah, 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 that ain't who you won't be hanging out with. Those, are not, those aren't men either. They're not, they're not even begin at the same level of consideration that the men that I'm talking about, taking the risk I'm talking about, are even at. It's a whole nother ball field. It's a whole other level of becoming something that our gods expect us to become to ever justify a seat at the table. He answered, Sigmund's son with Sigurd's sword that late with flesh have fed the ravens. Late with flesh had fed the ravens. So he killed Fafner at Bregan's behest. He slew a dragon. And we're all so tempted to think, hey, he beat a dragon. He tackled the great monstrosity that threatens every young man to ever be encouraged to fight valiantly, to struggle against those things. What he slayed was those teachings that kept him in, indentured to a lesser man. He rid himself of those teachings that kept him s serving a man who did not have his best interest at heart. He unlearned the teachings of a society that has no interest whatsoever in seeing men become men and enjoy success. He shed part of that and stepped out on his own, and he found his saddlebags full of treasure. And it's the same thing with us. To unlearn those teachings and learn new teachings, to be literate in the realm of the spirit that we are all standing on the shores of. Because that's literally what's at hand here. We are standing at the shore of a great, grand, new horizon, and there's a sea we must cross, a sea that our gods took a feast in at Eager's Feast when they sat at the table and had a cauldron a mile wide. Tyr dealt with that when he went to get that cauldron from his parents, and it was the warder of men that, that, that had his back. Another man had his back as he had to go deal with his shitty dad. There was a beautiful mother there, though, wasn't there? 
that helped him secure that cauldron a mile wide the gods might brew the greatest of needs in. It's our turn to feast in that sea. It's our turn to feast in that great, magnificent sea of spirituality and find those horizons we all want to feel. We feel them right here in our heart. We all know they're out there. And we keep getting bogged down by bullshit, it seems like. And these relationships are the big part of it. It requires becoming a man, becoming a man. And for the women, it requires them to be women. Now, I've often said in today's world, since the 60s, it's kind of been a big orgy amongst people. You're probably not going to find a virgin, right? But I promise you, if you do it right, you will find new, beautiful dimensions of her heart that she may not even know she has. That's our awesome, wonderful burden and responsibility in this faith. The first thing she does when that's released, when the beauty of who she is, is once again exposed to the world. After he has unlearned the teachings and slain the dragon and had the courage to walk through the fire and take off that mask that he shows to the world and expose who he is, he recognizes the woman, he cuts free the Bernie, she expresses the beauty of who she is to the world. These are all dynamic and magnificent actions and they're all an integral part of forming a solid, stable, intimate relationship with someone that you want to, that you can, that you have the ability to. He sat beside her and asked her her name. She took a horn full of mead and gave him a memory drop. She's going to remind him that he is a man. And it's the same thing in, in the Hindu faiths. When Kali couples with Shiva, that primal savage nature of, of the wild, there's many images of her sitting on top of him with her tongue sticking out, telling everybody, you know, eat a dick, you're going to have to deal with it. I'm fixing to make this man a god. And she does. Hail the day, hail the sons of day, and night on her daughter now. Look on us here with loving eyes that waiting we victory win. What a magnificent first part of probably the perfect prayer, if there is such a thing, in this also true faith. Hail the day and the sons of day. Hail the night and her daughter now. Her daughter is your, the earth itself, the mother of Thor. Look on us now with loving eyes. What more could we expect to hope than to have those loving eyes cast upon us in the hardest of times, in the darkest of nights, at the moments when we're strongest? That waiting we victory win. There's no rush. There's no swift day eating our lunch. We know all things are going to go our way. Hail to the gods, ye goddesses, hail. Hail the Aesir and the Aesir year. And all the generous earth, all the good things come from this generous earth. Give to us wisdom and goodly speech. What can you ask for? And healing hands lifelong. To hold the hand of someone you care about deeply. What greater treasure might there be in this world? And it's a real tough son of a bitch and nut to crack but it's all right here in our Lord. There is no great challenge for a man to go out and compete in the battlefield unless you join the army or have to do a little time. Those great proving grounds of the battlefields are few and far between. But in this lore, in, this, in these magnificent stories, we should all be very much aware that there are many faucets to it. Each layer reveals another layer, and each layer reveals another layer. And all of it is a part of who and what we are and how we're going to grow and how we're going to be worth our salt and how we're going to demonstrate to the world that we've found something here that's helping us become what we're supposed to become. And the battlefield may not necessarily be with our fists. It's going to be in our minds and in our hearts. First thing we got to do is figure out how to express it to each other. It takes a man to do that. And it takes a good woman to figure it out and understand it and appreciate it for what it is. What greater victory might you ever achieve in life than to find that standing at your side? You're going to take a few hits. We're all going to take a few lumps until we figure it out. But keep looking in this lore. I promise you, it'll click. The answer's there. If somebody doesn't like that you're looking at it, 
and don't worry about it. Keep trying. Get up and try again. She says, long did I sleep. My slumber was long, and long are the griefs of life. Sometimes they are, but you remember what Zvitdag's mother said. She said, uh, I can find it. Long is the way, long must thou wander, but long is love as well. Thou mayest find perchance what thou fain wouldst have with the face their favor will give. Sigurd just found it. And she told him, long are the griefs of life. And now I'm free. I hope that someday some each of you gets to figure out that after the long griefs of life that there have been growth, that you find out, yeah, the long has been the way, but long is love as well. And maybe that'll show up in your world. That's the best thing I could hope for all of you. It's the only thing I want for the people that pay attention to this. Find that. Work your ass off for it. Sit down, cry, write it out, burn it, go find somebody to talk to, find other men that are willing to support you in that effort, find other women that are willing to believe, and give it hell. It's all we got to prove who we are. The most important thing we can do in this world is escort those people closest to us and around us is to take their hand and escort them as lovingly as possible to that doorway of the grave mound and greet the sun facing goddess with as much love as we can. And I don't care how you break it down. That's a hell of a fucking challenge, but it's one worth trying. So let's try it again. Thank you guys. I'm done. Anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to tell you about it. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. You have to unmute yourself. Well, it's not so much a question as an observation. I'm a nurse and a nursing home, and some observations that I found is that, like you were talking about, you're always reinventing yourself to a certain extent. You have to move past what you've become to become something new. That's and it. uh, it's when people aren't able to do that anymore, when that growth stops, I think that's when we really become old, when we, re when we really start to decline. Um, I mean, people will have Alzheimer's and stuff like that, but the people, I have people that just give up. They're, they have family that visits them every day, but they just decided it was no longer worth it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, like I, something goes out in eyes. I know what you're talking about. It's they, they can't fathom not being able to do one thing and not understanding that in this condition, well, there might be something else I can do. And their life revolves. It's like the guy that's, that's 50 years old, still talking about the glory days of when he played football in high school. You know, and it's the same principle. But yeah, you're right. I, I imagine it's a very painful thing to watch in those nursing homes. Can it can be, but it, it, you can see it in normal people. I mean, I, I see people talking on, online. I, I've had a, 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 a just today one of the uh, housekeepers said that their uh, seventeen-year-old cousin tried to commit suicide because the world changed and he couldn't figure out how to change with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. What part of myself do I set aside to go on and become something more? We never understand that if we do set something aside, part of that, um, that there's other more powerful aspects of our being that will fill that void, that will strengthen and embolden us to try more, to become something more. Like we, we know we can build muscles. We know we can learn things, but we, for the damnedest reasons, cannot seem to understand that we can build our hearts as well, that we can exercise that emotional ability to give a shit. And, 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 and make it stronger. You know what I mean? Uh, but it is there. I mean, it just, it is there. And you see certain people show up with that. You see certain people that have that unique ability to smile at someone and they, they know, Hey, I, okay. I feel that, that dude, that's kind of cool. You know, and, 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 um, people need that. People need that word of encouragement. People need to feel and see that. 
Um, I watched Jordan Peterson, and I know some people don't much care for him, but I, I find that he's a exceptionally brilliant man. He, he, he gave a very heartfelt talk about that, that, that people are literally dying for a word of encouragement. And, you know, I think um, we get so, what's the word to use? We get so emotionally numb that we're not willing to accept that word of encouragement anymore. Because, well, they don't really mean it, or they want something, or any of a number of reasons. I, if I, even me, if I reach out to somebody and just say, hey, um, I saw that, I, I think you've done a fine job, you've done really good. Um, the first reaction for most people is, especially from women, is what's this dude want from me? I don't want nothing from you. I'm just saying hi, wishing you the best. And, um, but it doesn't mean I'm, yeah, it doesn't mean I'm ever going to stop doing that. <laughs> I'll, never mind. Anything else? Anybody else have a question? Well, I want to tell you, Brian, that, uh, I always appreciate when you reach out and you give me encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Good. I appreciate that. Good. Okay, guys. I really uh, I really do appreciate everybody joining in. I love to see a bunch of people here and I like I love it. Um it's just good. Tomorrow's Monday. It's a bunch of us still working, and I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to go out there and grab it by the nose and whip its ass and see what I can make happen. And thank you all for joining me tonight. Go out there and try again. That's all I can tell you. Go out there and try again. If you, if you find yourself knocked down, uh, give me a call. I'll help you get back up. I promise. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, thank you Brian. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.